Hi, I'm Dr. Sandy Morgan from Vanguard University's Global Center for Women and Justice. It is an honor for me to be invited to speak to the Society of Pentecostal Studies. We are all in a very unique year, and I've been asked to address the issues of violence against women, and specifically in the context of human trafficking. And I want to do that from a practical theology perspective. In a practical theology paradigm, Osmer tells us that we have to ask four questions. What is going on? That's our descriptive empirical task. Why is this going on? That's our interpretive task. And what ought to be going on, the normative task, and how might we respond, the pragmatic task. These are questions of integrating our faith and social justice. So let's start with addressing what is going on. Human trafficking, modern day slavery, where people are exploiting people is happening at a rate that is unknown historically. Depending on whose statistics you're reading, more than 40 million people are trafficked every year. And this includes children, 71% are women, one in four are under the age of 18. Child trafficking happens in formats like child soldiers, mining, textile factories, child brides, and even on plantations harvesting bananas and cocoa and fields of blueberries. So we have a perfect storm in our world when we look at three things, greed, vulnerability, and demand. And those are the issues that I want to address with you today, especially in the context of COVID-19. The pandemic has accelerated so many things. And in fact, this is one of my favorite graphics. I hear people say that, well, with the global pandemic, we're all in the same boat, but I would put to you that we are not all in the same boat. Many of us are in a boat with um, running water, we put into port, we pick up groceries, but there are those who are in a rowboat with no oars. And the verse I want to share with you today is Proverbs 31.8. I know usually when women talk about Proverbs 31, we're going to talk to you about the, um, the woman who is powerful and buys fields and is virtuous. But just before that, we're mandated to be a voice for those who have no voice and ensure justice for those being crushed. Now, when I think about who's being crushed, the pandemic gives me a whole new perspective on that. And I need to understand how is that crushing happening? Why is this going on? The interpretive task, and I'm just going to, in this short time, give you a few of the perspectives about why this is going on. In a perfect storm, greed drives the issues that make people vulnerable. Greed that takes the idea of profit and brings it to a new level when it's based on exploiting other people. Forced labor generates annual profits of more than $150 billion. And the people being exploited for their labor are everywhere, Asia Pacific, in our more developed countries. This is a myth. People believe that, well, it's happening over there. But we have this uh, phenomenon right here where I live, 
in Orange County, California, one of the wealthiest counties in the entire U.S. It happens in Central and Southeastern Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, and the Caribbean, and in the Middle East. Greed, somebody wants to make money off of other people. And here's the thing, we sort of think that the traffickers are the greedy ones, but think about this for yourself. I love this app. If you're stuck doing homeschooling right now and that wasn't your first choice, think about doing this exercise with your kids. This is an app. And in this app, you can evaluate your lifestyle and come up with an answer, your slavery footprint. How many slaves work for you? Did you make your own clothes? Did you pick the cotton and spin it? Did you, did you shave the wool from the sheep? The p workers who are in those mines, in those textile factories, some are not getting a fair wage. Some are even slaves. So how do we begin to change our usage patterns? Because greed is part of what makes this perfect storm. Vulnerability. Vulnerability, I know, I know, I talk to people about this and they just feel so overwhelmed with the needs. Let's look at poverty globally and in your own community. In your own community, are there people who don't have enough to eat? Are there people who don't have secure housing? Are there people who are unemployed and unable to find a job? Poverty often drives vulnerability for being trafficked. Human trafficking is often based on the vulnerable people that the traffickers are able to find. And I want you to start thinking about the elements of human trafficking. In human trafficking, someone identifies a vulnerable person and based on their weaknesses, recruits um, and moves them, obtains them through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. And often, the movies tell you that they're kidnapped, they're, they're thrown into a dungeon, but more often than not, they're recruited with the offer of a job. Their dreams make them more vulnerable. They want to make a better living. In one particular example, when I lived in Greece for 10 years and I worked with victims of human trafficking, I met a young woman who had just graduated from high school in Ukraine and her mother and eight-year-old brother were depending on her to become the breadwinner. She had just graduated at the top of her class from high school, but there were no jobs. The Soviet Union had imploded. Her father had died in a previous Chechnyan conflict. And so what was she to do? So she would look in the newspapers and she saw an ad for interviews to work in Greece. So she took the bus into the big city on the appointed day, stood in line with dozens of other girls, filled out a job application, and you put everything on your job application. They would know where she lived, that her mother and eight-year-old brother were there, and at the end of the day, she was thrilled to go home and tell her mother, I got the job. I'm going to be leaving in two weeks and go and work in a hotel in Athens, Greece, in the tourist industry. And on the appointed day, she showed up with her documents, got on the train, the train went down to the Black Sea where they took the ferry across into Turkey. And that night, when she was tired of travel, she laid down on the bed and then she tells us, just a few minutes later, the door burst open and four men dressed in police uniforms, not because not because they were necessarily law enforcement, but as part of the breaking down process, we'll call her Maria, she was gang raped. And the next morning, her wrists, ankles, and mouth were duct taped. 
an envelope of money changed hands, and she was placed in the vault's bottom of a little car and driven across the border into Greece, where brothel owners were waiting to purchase her. She was then moved every couple of weeks. She didn't have an opportunity to make friends, to learn the language. And when she lost all hope of escape for herself, they told her, it's okay if you run away, and they held that job application up. We know where your eight-year-old brother lives, and there's a market for boys. When Maria was rescued and brought to the Doctors of the World shelter, she wasn't rescued because people were looking for her individually. The owners of the brothels had gotten together and put all of their really, really sick girls in one bar and called the hotline in order to offload the sick girls and the Doctors of the World shelter took them in. That illustrates the process of human trafficking. They obtained her by offering her a fraudulent job. Then they brutalized her force, and then they kept her under control, not with chains and ropes and padlocks, but with a threat against her own family. Another one of the vulnerabilities, and we're seeing this amplified during the pandemic, mental health issues, pain, the trauma of a childhood with adverse experiences, with abuse, and domestic violence. Those things feed the desire to find an escape, and someone offers that, and they end up getting into a situation that they can't get out of. Patriarchy. Now, I could talk for a long time about patriarchy. I just love um, Dr. April Westbrook's book on the women in Samuel called And He Will Take Your Daughters that shows how God responded to patriarchy and how God sees women. Unfortunately, globally, women are more often seen as second class. There are huge gaps in educational opportunities, huge gaps in wages. Patriarchy is one of the vulnerabilities that makes women more vulnerable to being trafficked. And as I mentioned earlier, 71% of victims of human trafficking are female. When we look at the perfect storm, the third highlight is demand. Because you can't have a business model that uses the term exploitation. Exploitation is a financial term without understanding that there is an economic demand triangle. You have merchandise, you have a seller, but if you don't have demand, you don't have a business. And unfortunately, in human trafficking, a person is the demand. And so reducing demand becomes a super important part of responding to ending human trafficking. I can't talk about demand without talking about the explosion of pornographic material. Pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry that exploits women, exploits children, exploits men. How do we reduce demand for the sexual exploitation of women and men and children? The issues around sexual abuse, child imagery, have multiplied to such a component that the vice president of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Cal Walsh, Walsh, was on my Ending Human Trafficking podcast recently and told us that those kinds of child abuse images have increased 96% this year. Pornography drives demand.
So here we are, practical theology. We've talked about what is going on. We've talked about why it's going on. Now, what ought to be going on? This is a very old, old, old graphic. We probably all learned this when we were maybe in fifth or sixth grade. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological needs, safety needs, belonging and love needs, esteem, being known and understood, aesthetic needs, self-actualization and transcendence. Imagine my horror when this wasn't being used to teach social workers and pastors and community leaders how to care well for their community, but instead was being used by a trafficker who wrote an article, also created um, and edited a group of articles that became a book. This article is called How to Be a Pimp, Using Maslow's Hierarchy of Human Need to Make the Most Money. And let me give you an example of what that looks like. I spoke to a survivor, Anna, I'll call her, who at 14 years of age, um, her mother, and who was a professional, they lived in a suburb here in California, but her mother met someone, they fell in love, and he moved in. Within a couple of weeks, he molested Anna. Child welfare came, and then you have to go through the process. Mom kicked him out, of course. Good mom. But now Anna is in a group home, and she doesn't like it, and she's 14, and she decides to run away. This is a very typical story because at 14, your brain isn't done so you don't have good risk management skills, and she didn't think about what she'd do when she ran away. But people who had been trained to be a pimp and take advantage of vulnerabilities were looking for her. So where do we find Anna after she runs away? Well, now we come and it's one o'clock in the morning and she's trying to sleep on a park bench. And the pimp who is looking to recruit goes three places, parks, bus stations, and the mall. And when he sees Anna on the park bench, he goes into his normal routine. He's practiced, he's skilled, and in this particular instance, he was 26 years old. He stopped on his way into the park and bought a dollar menu burger. And when he, and I'm gonna try and do this on this recording, when he saw her on the bench, um, he started to walk past her and then he looked and he appeared to be surprised and he said, what are you doing out here? Are you okay? But Anna is 14 and she knows to be afraid of strangers, so she doesn't respond. How many times have you been spoken to by a stranger at night and you just ignored them? Well, this guy didn't want her to be afraid, so he actually moved back in the other direction away from her. But he didn't stop. He held up the dollar menu burger bag and said, I'm not really hungry and I just bought this. If you are, then you can have this. Well, Anna was hungry and she didn't have any money. She didn't have a plan. She hadn't thought through the consequences. So she sits up, he comes over and he sits down next to her and now while he gives her food, physiological needs on Maslow's hierarchy, um, he asks her questions that he will use to control her later. And she pours out her story. She's feeling understood for the first time. Somebody's listening to her. When she finishes, he takes the trash even. And now he walks away from her again and he is taking it over to the trash and he comes, he starts to leave and then he turns back and he says, um, you know, it doesn't feel like it's very safe out here for you. 
why don't you come home and sleep on my couch and we'll figure out what to do tomorrow morning. So physiological needs, he fed her. Safety needs, he offered her a place to sleep where she wouldn't be afraid all night of being attacked. And then the next day he took her and bought her clothes. He told her how beautiful she was. Within a few days he was telling her he was falling in love with her. And now she has someone who cares about her. And by the end of the second week, though, he tells her, we, together, because now he's her boyfriend, we need to make some money, and here's what I need you to do. And he sent her out to turn tricks. He commercially, sexually exploited Anna. And the first time she was picked up, um, she, didn't, she didn't tell them who he, about her boyfriend. She protected him, and as soon as she got out, she went straight back to him. But the next time, several months later, unfortunately, that she was picked up, there was a team of experts who provided advocacy for her, who understood her trauma, commercial sexual exploitation, dis special disciplinary team. And she began to share about her experiences and how she began to think that they were in this together. He told her, when you're 18, we'll get married and the money that we've made will buy our house. So she actually reached the level of self-actualization. Now, you'd think I was back to the first question about what the problem is, but I'm challenging you with what things ought to look like, is that when you go back to this and you answer the question, what ought you be doing as the church, look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If there are people in your community that are vulnerable, how can you be the response, the Jesus response, at every one of these levels? I love food ministries. I take groceries to people in our church, but people need more than that. They need security and they need belonging and they need to know that you understand and accept them, and they need to have empowerment, self-actualization. This is what ought to be the norm. And if my contention is if the traffickers can learn this and teach this, why can't we? So how might we respond? What ought to be going on, what ought to be normative, is that we are responding to the hierarchy of needs. But now, the pragmatic task in front of us, how can we respond? Here at Vanguard University, we have um, a four, actually five-pronged approach. Research, we want to make data-driven decisions, not just emotional decisions. We want our students, our faculty, and our community partners to have the best information on women and justice issues to how we can make a difference in reducing vulnerability, in reducing demand, and in understanding what that storm looks like. Education, and I know many of you in the Society for Pentecostal Studies are educators. A lot of my colleagues are here today, and I have to tell you, I was really nervous about presenting in front of my colleagues. And so now I'm just in this little room by myself with a one friend recording. But I do believe that education is how we are going to improve the lives of the vulnerable and at-risk populations locally and globally. We just finished our Insure Justice Conference, always the first weekend in March, and Bishop Philip Kitoto from Kenya Assemblies of God spoke to us and he talked to us about how important it is to make sure girls get an education and here's the thing I know. Opportunity and access are two different things. 
girls have the opportunity of education in almost every country across the globe. The United Nations has done a fabulous job of making that a goal for every nation. But the reality is, yes, they can go to school if they can get there, if they have access. And if you live in a country where boys and girls have to be in separate buses and there's only one bus, then the girls don't go. In Bishop Kitoto's experience, there were girls that were missing school because they didn't have menstrual cycle hygiene products. Well, they had the opportunity to go to school, but they didn't have access. So their vulnerability increased. So the church, the church response in Kenya is basic. Let's make sure girls have everything they need to get to education. Advocacy, remember Proverbs 31, eight? Be a voice for those who have no voice. Ensure justice for those being crushed. So advocacy means teaching and modeling and speaking up. One of the wonderful things that I got to do this last year was serve on the Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council by presidential appointment. I was able to take what I've learned here in my community to a national platform and create opportunities for research and advocacy across 20 federal agencies. I believe, and this is our fourth um, pillar in our platform, collaboration builds hope. And collaboration means that we engage and connect and coordinate with diverse agencies and develop and leverage multidisciplinary expertise and resources. So I practice what I preach. I invited our Department of Education to collaborate with us for Ensure Justice. And for several years, they did. And then a few years ago, the superintendent said, let's make this formal. So this was our third Insured Justice, where we co-sponsored Insured Justice with the Orange County Department of Education. Collaboration. William Wilberforce told us how he passed the first transatlantic slavery legislation in the UK through overlapping networks. He brought together legislators and faith leaders and community leaders, including the elites in academia, and through that created overlapping networks. And what I want you to understand is those overlapping networks become a safety net for the most vulnerable that if you don't have that, if you only have a couple of strands and you're trying by yourself to do this, they'll fall through. We need to be working together in our communities. And part of that includes understanding Matthew 28, 19. Sometimes I'm challenged that my focus is on social justice and consequently I'm not making disciples. Consequently, I'm not leading people to Jesus. But I told you I lived in Greece for 10 years. I love studying the Greek language and I'll never forget, I had only been there a few months and so when I would go to church, I would have a Greek Bible on one hand and um, an English Bible on the other. And if the pastor was preaching a scripture that I already knew, that made it a lot easier. And I, I'm gonna be really honest, when he read Matthew 28, 19, my brain said, oh, you got that wrong because I memorized, go into all the world. Did you? But he didn't say that. He actually said, as you are going into all the world, make disciples. My life changed at that moment. First of all, I called my mom 
and told her about this and she said, see, I didn't want you to move across the ocean. You didn't have to go. Well, I did have to go because God showed me where to go. So I'm not advocating that you don't go when God calls you to go. But as you are going, whether you are a pastor, a professor, a nurse, a doctor, an attorney, as you are going, you're making disciples. So as I'm going to the UN, to Baghdad, to teach in the Ministry of Higher Education, whether I'm going to federal agencies or my local task force, I don't need to preach. I need to act. And whoever is going with me, if they're walking with me, they're walking towards Jesus. I'm following the principles of Jesus. If you're doing this with me, I want you to do it with your whole heart, with compassion and empathy for those who are vulnerable. And when you go into those other form, formats, those forums, that's what I wanted to say, when you go into those other forums, you need to be able to speak their language. I lived on one side of the Acropolis and my office was on the other side. So I often walked the mile and a half to my office. I was in a lot better health then. And I would cross over the Acropolis and walk right by Mars Hill where they have a huge plaque of Paul's speech. Paul studied the language of the day. He didn't come and say, here's what, I'm going to teach you how to speak my language. He studied their language. And when he did that, he was able to introduce them to the unknown God. Well, if you're going to step up to combat human trafficking, learning how to see people as created in the image of God is not a hard task, but learning the language of what that looks like from a more contemporary secular perspective means that you need to learn a victim-centered, trauma-informed approach. So I can teach all the things I believe about how we treat other people in Mago Day, And I can do it with this particular model that is recognized around the world in the anti-human trafficking field. Partnership, prevention, protection, prosecution, and policies with a goal to prioritize people over process. Does that fit your theology? This is how we can respond. This is where, if you're interested in learning about what I did with the public-private partnership, I wanted to share that with you. And I want to bring a more global language to how we as a church respond. I just want to talk to you from my heart for a moment. I have been um, very sad sometimes when the church responds to human trafficking with a very hypersexualized response and values those who have been sex trafficked over those who have been labor trafficked. One of the things they don't understand is many, many labor trafficked victims have also been sexually abused. They have no rights and sexual assault can become part of their lives as well. But the scholars in other disciplines have noticed our response as a church and have questioned why we are so, the Christian community, focused on sex. And I'm not going to explore that question. I'm just going to ask you to have a more global perspective about how you respond. 
One of the things that I love to use to help me learn the language of my community so that I can be like Paul in my community, I ask my students to learn the sustainable development goals. So many of them literally fit my values as a Christian and understanding that someone who is making my clothes in a textile factory in Bangladesh and are, they're at risk for very poor working conditions and abuse and not having days off and then not getting paid. I can begin to advocate for them, not only to my church, but also to my community using the sustainable development goals. Answer to question number four includes how do we respond? We respond with a global approach. That means I'm looking inside the label on my clothes to find out, oops, sorry guys, I went too forward back to those pictures, to find out where they were made and to make decisions that I'm not going to purchase things that drive demand for cheap products. Now that changed my entire view of what it means to be a good steward. First of all, I was a missionary. Second of all, my mother raised me to shop for groceries by looking at the Wednesday ads. So spending less was my definition of stewardship. Now I go into schools or my, my students go into schools peer-to-peer -peer leadership and they ask kids um, and uh, how, how much they spend on chocolate and many times they don't spend very much and then we show them the children that are literally slaves on cocoa plantations on the east coast or no sorry the west coast of Africa children are harvesting cocoa beans with big machetes and maybe this kid is 10 or 11 years old so that I can have cheap chocolate no thank you the price of that chocolate is too high because a child is not getting an education and a parent has lost the dignity of providing for their children so what would it look like if I bought chocolate that was authenticated as free of any slavery. That would mean that the parents got a job and could pay for their kids' school clothes and books so those kids can go to school. One uh, young survivor here in the U.S. was nine years old when she was trafficked from Togo to the United States, labor trafficked, and the reason she was trafficked is because her parents believed they were sending her here to get an education. So good stewardship may mean I eat less chocolate because I can't buy expensive chocolate and chocolate that's been proven slave free usually costs two to three dollars. And that's not a bad thing because I probably don't need to eat as much candy anyway. So that's probably good stewardship of my body. So we can respond by teaching our kids what good stewardship looks like. This is one of my favorite ways to pass on empathy to our kids. I was teaching a group of social workers and one of the, it was a two-day conference, and the next day the one of the moms came and said so I downloaded the sweat and toil app that you told me about and I had to pick up my daughter three and a half years old and we stopped at the grocery store and on this app you can download this on an Android or an Apple phone it shows the countries and the products and I don't know if you can see here the tiny little hands but she said, we looked at where the bananas came from and they were on this app. So I showed my daughter the tiny little hand and we decided not to buy bananas today because we didn't want to buy bananas where children had been forced to harvest bananas instead of being in school.
same principle, Uzbekistan, 20% of the world's cotton, and children are forced to harvest cotton instead of being in school. The stories go over and over. So we start teaching empathy now, not just go to a rally and learn about human trafficking, but we start teaching empathy and Imago Day to our kids in our Sunday schools, in our Royal Rangers, in our girls groups, everywhere, so that the next generation understands that their choices change lives. So I'm going to close with this, um, with this story. I was learning to sail when I lived in Greece, and I actually completed my sailing lessons all in Greek, and I passed the written exam, but there was one more test. We had to do a night sail from the port of Athens all the way to the island of Idra. And the Mediterranean is beautiful to sail on. Uh, the ocean here in California scares me. But we were sailing and a storm came up. Oh my goodness, it made me think of the disciples in the boat when the storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. And the storm came, there, we were out in the middle of the, um, the sea. There was, we couldn't see land, we couldn't see lights. And by, oh, a half an hour, an hour into that, the only person still standing was our captain. He had been through storms before. He had the skills, and he kept us on track. The rest of us were just hanging on for dear life, sick as could be. And then the storm began to abate. But I still had my eyes closed, and my friend Calliope came and, and she, she poked me and she said, Open your eyes, open your eyes. And when I opened my eyes, this is just about what I could see. And all of a sudden, I was so encouraged because Isaiah 40 verse 26 includes this phrase about the stars. He calls them all by name. It's not my job to rescue every victim of human trafficking. It's not even my job to know all their names. God knows them all by name. And as I looked at that sky, God spoke in my own heart to my own pain. And this is the thing I believe that we all need to acknowledge. We have pain that we sometimes can't name, and we have shame, and so we don't talk about it. There are a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between the vulnerabilities that result in human trafficking and the vulnerabilities in violence against women and in domestic violence. And just weeks before I did this final sailing exam, I had learned that my daughter was in a domestic violent marriage. And I was devastated I didn't even know at the beginning how horrific it had been, but I did know that one of the reasons that my daughter stayed in that horrific abuse is because her abuser told her that if you leave, it will ruin your parents' missionary career. And I thought, my daughter had lived in that for eight years because she didn't want her escape to create shame for us 
I have to tell you, I told her right away, um, that's not true. And don't we know that the accuser is a liar and will trap people with shame? So part of our response, that fourth question, is to recognize that we are all called to see each other, Imago Dei, created in the image of God, and know that God calls each one by name. So as I opened my eyes and I saw all those stars, God gave me a promise that my daughter would have as many blessings as stars that I could see. And I knew that I knew that I knew that he keeps his promise and he calls them all by name and I can't carry this all by myself. The perfect storm has a conclusion. The church, like the disciples, needs to get out of the boat and go to work right where they are, making disciples as they're going. That's my call to each of you. I, um, I want you to know that I'm available. You can email, you can call. We have all kinds of resources to equip you. This issue of human trafficking, of violence against women, is something the church can be part of responding to. In, um, in a book that Elaine Storkey wrote, wrote called Scars Across Humanity. I interviewed her and I asked her how do we turn things upside down? How do we go back and recover the equal value for women with men? And she told me something that I pass on to my students all the time. Young men Young leaders, pastors, youth pastors, college students need to soak in the Gospels and see how Jesus responded to vulnerability, to women, to abuse. Soak in the Gospels and then do what Jesus would do. Let me pray now. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and just share from my heart about the storm in our society that feeds on greed and vulnerability and demand. And I ask you, Lord, to use this frame of practical theology so that we stop and ask ourselves how does the church respond and how do I respond and then pick up my Bible my textbook my platform and no matter where I'm going make disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.